Okay, so part two, Torah and science. Last time we talked about the Big Bang and the age of the universe, which are big questions. And then today we're going to talk about evolution, which is the other big question. When it comes to like Torah and science issues, those are the ones that always come up. It's like what the Big Bang, the age of the universe, and evolution. And I put the origins of life in there because it's related to the, this topic of biology in general. So we're going to address that also. So we're going to do what we did last time, which is we're going to first look at what does the science actually say. And then we're going to look at what does the Torah say. And to do this properly, we have to really go into the science. So a little bit more than last time, I want to take you through what exactly is evolution. I think that's something that's actually misunderstood. That not everybody is actually clear on what evolution is. We're going to first talk about that. What exactly is evolution? And what, what does the science say? And then we're going to see, is that compatible? Could that be compatible with the Torah or not? Number one, we have to understand DNA, how that works, which Darwin actually didn't know anything about. He, he, he predicted or proposed something like that exists. Uh, he called them gemules. But he didn't know anything about genes or DNA. That, all that stuff was discovered and uncovered much later in the last century. So DNA, we know, is our code, codes for our, our bodies, our proteins. And DNA can, can and does mutate. It can pick up errors. So as it gets, as it replicates, as an organism lives, DNA can have mistakes. And DNA is a code. It's like a bunch of letters, four letters four-letter alphabet right? if you remember your high school biology a c t and g the four letters four bases so you have this sequence and sometimes there are mistakes the mutation in the sequence and most of the time mutations are detrimental they can they cause cancer god forbid they cause all kinds of defects but occasionally a, a mutation could be beneficial and result in some positive trait that'll help an organism survive. And so that's where we get to this idea of survival of the fittest. We've all heard that idea before. So those organisms that are kind of the most fit yeah, will survive and pass on their genes to the next generation. So those traits will pass on to the next generation too. So you have this new trait, a mutation causes some new trait. And then that trait, assuming it helps this organism be more fit, better adapt, it'll, it's more likely to pass on to the next generation. And so over long periods of time, the accumulation of the new traits would cause the, re the result would be speciation, right? New species would emerge over long, long, long periods of time. So we don't, uh, you, you can't really see it in one lifetime, but over, let's say, millions of years, you would see new species. So we talked about dealing with millions of years last time. So that's not an issue for us anymore. Okay, so that's, that's that. So let's look at some of the evidence for evolution. One of the pieces of evidence is this is going to be some of the things that you would see in a biology textbook. Uh, for example, today we have many, many species of, or no, I shouldn't say species, many different types, breeds of dogs. Uh, and they all emerged from the, their common ancestor. They were all bred from, in some way, from the gray wolf. So over the past, let's say, let's roughly 10,000 years, maybe a little bit more, breeding these dogs, breeding for certain traits, selecting for certain traits, uh, produces all these different breeds of dogs. So they're all still dogs. It's all one species. They can all interbreed with each other. All, these, the, all the dog breeds that we have today all come from one common ancestor, and that's over a very short period of time, right? So over, let's say, 10,000 years, we've produced all these very different traits 
And theoretically, if you continue doing this, eventually these dogs will become separate species. And you already see that today, because if you have something like a little Chihuahua and then you have like a huge Great Dane, uh, to get them to mate is going to become very difficult, right? Just simply because they have such different physical features, right? Their size difference is just going to start to get really hard to mate them. So if that keeps going, eventually they would become separate species. And that could no longer, we're defining species, by the way, like the classic definition of a species is two organisms that, or two living things that can mate with each other and produce offspring. And the offspring can also produce offspring. So something like a horse and a donkey, you can mate them and you will make a, a what? What do you make? Uh, mule. Mule. Yeah. So you make a mule with a horse and a donkey. However, a horse and a donkey are not one species because even though they can mate, a mule cannot. A mule is unable to produce viable offspring. And so that's why a horse and a donkey would not be considered one species. You know, that's like the classic definition of a species is a, a mating, a pair that can mate and produce offspring that also can produce viable offspring. So that's one piece of evidence. Related to that is how we have selected for various vegetables. So cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, they all come from the same plant. They all have a common ancestor, the name of which is up here, the scientific name. And they, you select for different things. So if you select, if farmers selected for the terminal buds, then eventually you get cabbage for lateral buds, Brussels sprouts for the stems, for the leaves. And so kale is like, has massive leaves. So that's where we're breeding, where we're crossing the plant to produce bigger and bigger leaves. Each generation, you take the biggest leaves of this yield and cross them and then do it again. So you keep crossing the ones that have the biggest leaves. So over many generations, you're selecting for that trait. You're going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger leaves. Corn is another famous example. This is what corn originally looked like, the original wild corn. Not very appealing. And then since it's been domesticated, we keep, again, selecting for the best traits, the juiciest, the biggest kernels. And so today we have a really nice corn that looks basically nothing like the original corn ancestor. So these species are changing. That's the idea. Ultimately, what evolution is about is, is change. Organisms are changing over time. That's the simplest definition of it. How that happens, there's all kinds of ideas. The most famous is natural selection. The, the survival of the fittest idea. But we see for sure that organisms change over time. Uh, that this is, and we see that right now in the reality that we're all living in with COVID. And we keep hearing about variants and right? another variant. Another, what is that? Right. What, are, what are variants? This is what it is, a mutation, and you have a new virus variant. The virus is evolving. With antibiotics, it's a big problem because bacteria keep evolving resistance. They keep getting, as time goes on, more and more resistance to our antibiotics. So we have to keep developing new antibiotics. And there's a big scare. The big fear is what if you get like a super resistant bacteria? Imagine that a bacteria emerges that is resistant to all of our current antibiotics, what would you do? Like that would be very, like you wouldn't be able to treat it. And what, that could just, that could be horrendous. So you hear about this, the scare of what would happen if there was a super resistant bacteria, bacteria resistant to everything. The first antibiotics, by the way, were discovered by a couple of Jewish scientists. So another good to know. Uh, so that's antibiotics, bacteria, viruses, they're always evolving. We see with them, with, back, with bacteria and viruses, it's the easiest to see evolution because they reproduce so quickly that we can actually track that, those changes over short periods of time. So even something like coronavirus or over the past year already, we see it evolving. We see new variations of the virus emerge. Uh, 
So that's evolution before our eyes. Cla another classic example that you would see in any textbook is homologous structures, where animals that are part of the same kind of general family, it's not really a family, more like a phylum, but in the same group, let's say, have similar traits, even though they're adapted for totally different uses. So let's say your, your arm and a whale arm, which is really a fin, have a lot of the same bones. And a bat's arm, which is for flight, has a lot of the same bones. Okay, so whales, bats, humans, cats, they're all mammals. So they all have very similar structures. Okay. A whale fin and a shark fin are completely different because sharks are not mammals. So superficially, they might look similar. But inside of a whale fin, you have these bones that are very similar to your bones, but a shark doesn't. So that suggests some kind of common ancestry, right? As if they came from a common uh, blueprint, because they're all mammals. So you have homologous structures and analogous structures. Another piece of evidence is the fossil record, which, of course, we all know about that. We've all seen it. We've all been to museums. There are all kinds of organisms that are extinct that don't exist anymore. You know, and uh, the further you dig, you see different with every kind of strata, every layer beneath our feet, you got different organisms living there. So you kind of get like, like a little historical record of the past. And you see all kinds of different organisms there. Different periods of time, different organisms. Another piece of evidence, which is, I think, in some cases, in some ways, the strongest evidence is genetics. That's like really hard evidence. So something like uh, you and a fruit fly, you're very different, but you share about 44% of the same genes. Humans and mice, 92%. That's why mice are so good for us to experiment on. We can learn a lot about ourselves by experimenting on mice and rats. With chimpanzees, it's even closer. Right, like 98% the same genes. So that also builds a picture of ancestry, of common ancestors, the blueprint that we would have come from. So mammals have a lot of shared genes. Mammals and even plants, or animals and plants, which are both called eukaryotic cells, have a lot of similar genes. So different than prokaryotes, let's say, which are like bacteria. So you and a plant are very, look very different, but on a cellular level, you have a lot of the same proteins. So there's still a lot in common between you and a banana. I think it's also like 40% genes between a human and a banana. It's like maybe something like 40%, if I'm not mistaken, the same. So the closer uh, the species are to us, the, the more genetic similarities that we have. That's another piece of evidence. Uh, there's a lot more to discuss, and we can't, this is not a course on evolution, so I like this short video from Vox that I can send you the link after, and shows all kinds of other things, focuses on things that are vestigial structures that, uh, that we still have in our bodies that we don't need anymore. So one of the things that shows in this video is, uh, one that I like is the muscles around the ears, muscles around the ears. So you can watch this later, I'm not gonna show this now, but your ears twitch uh, as if they were like animal ears and could pretend like in animals, those muscles, like, you know, like a dog can like turn its ears like totally back. Like if it hears sound from the back, it'll turn its ears kind of to the back and to the front and to the side. So our ears can't do that. Like our ears don't really move, right? But we still have the muscles for that. And right? the muscles are still there and our ears were, will twitch in a, on like a very small scale, very subtly, as if uh, as if the ears are trying to turn behind, you know, you hear a sound from behind. So they're trying to like turn behind and hear what's coming, but they don't actually turn, right? But the muscles are still there. So there's all kinds of vestigial structures like that in our bodies of things that we maybe had in the past, but we don't have anymore. Okay. So that was some of the evidence for evolution. And the evidence is pretty strong. The evidence is pretty strong for evolution. I mean, we're living it. 
if we're developing antibiotics and vaccines, we have to deal with species evolving. So the evidence is really strong for it. Now let's actually reevaluate the evidence a little bit. And, and kind of maybe rebuttal some of these points. So the first thing is when we talk about artificial selection. That's used very often as like proof of you see evolution happens, like things can change very drastically over time. However, artificial selection is something that's done deliberately by people. This is not a random process at all. With, with the, a natural selection, natural selection is also not random. Some people make the mistake of saying that it's random. It's not, it's not actually random. The mutations are random, but natural selection is not, the process is not random. But with this, it's a deliberate people that are crossing, you know, crossing two dogs or whatever, and trying to produce a certain trait selecting for a trait, doing it over and over and over again deliberately. It's not just in nature where species, you know, come together. There's no, there's no order in, in nature in that sense. There's nobody choosing, we say natural selection. I used to have a professor in uh, university who would make fun of the term natural selection because a professor of evolution, he would make fun of the term natural selection because he'd say, what does that even mean? like nature is selecting now so like what is it like is nature like a god is are we are we deif deifying nature what does that mean that nature selects right nature doesn't select anything right nature just is so in nature there is no order like like we have on a farm or in a, some whatever where we we can breed or cross species and do it deliberately over and over and over again until we get the result that we want nature can't do that right? and even with this after 10,000 years of making all these different types of dogs, at the end of the day, they're still dogs. You know, even with deliberate changes, selecting for traits, they have not, as far as we can tell, speciated and become different. Maybe they will eventually, but so far we haven't reached that point and it doesn't look like we ever will. So as much as we keep selecting for traits, they're not actually speciating. They're still dogs at the end of the day. And the same is true when we talk about viruses and bacteria. They change their genomes very rapidly, but they still, like coronavirus is still coronavirus. So even with picking up lots of mutations, it doesn't become a different virus. It's still that virus with some, some variation. Uh, I think the E. coli genome, if I'm not mistaken, just over the past like 30 years has changed by something like close to 20%. But an E. coli bacteria is still an E. coli bacteria. It hasn't become some new species of bacteria, even with such drastic genetic changes. So this, this, that's a big problem for evolution, right? Like, do we have real, some people, distinguish it by saying microevolution versus macroevolution. Right? Like we might have small scale changes, but do we really have big scale leaps of seeing totally new species? Of course, the counter argument is, well, microevolution is macroevolution just over a longer period of time. Just like you need time. You always need more time. Right? In terms of mutations, just attacking the very foundations of evolution, we need mutation. The evolution is driven by mutation. Without mutation, you have no new traits. So the only way muta evolution can happen is if we're generating new traits through mutation. But if we look at like our genome, most of our DNA is not coding. It doesn't actually really do any, it doesn't code for any traits. So the majority of mutations happen in that 90% of the DNA that doesn't do anything anyways. And even those mutations that do happen, we have proofreading mechanisms. Your, our DNA, there's a whole bunch of enzymes in our nucleus that are constantly proofreading, editing the DNA, making sure there are no mistakes. So even when a mistake does happen, we have mechanisms to repair them. And even then, 
if the proofreading mechanism doesn't work and we miss something, the chances of that mutation being beneficial are extremely, extremely, extremely small. The vast majority of mutations, over 99.9% .9 of mutations are dangerous. They're deleterious if they're not neutral. The majority of mutations really are neutral because so much of the DNA is non-coding. But of the mutations that are not neutral, pretty much all of them are deleterious. They cause damage. They usually cause cancer. They cause some defect. They cause problems. Mutations cause problems. It's extremely rare to find a beneficial mutation. And even in like standard biology textbooks, the examples that they give for a beneficial mutation is all is nothing like, it's nothing that's going to take your breath away. It's like very it's tiny, you know, like the classic example is like sickle cell anemia and malaria that you'll see this like in every textbook that like this mutation can cause, can, can uh, will allow some people to be resistant to malaria. But then other people, if they, if they are homozygous, if you remember that term, to have malaria, to be, to have sickle cell anemia, sorry, to make them sick. Uh, but then that, that's used as like an example of a mutation that might be beneficial sometimes. You know, it makes you a little bit more resistant to malaria. It's not, that's the kind of, those are the kinds of examples that we have. They're not like spectacular, like, wow, that really is an amazing beneficial mutation. We don't really have good examples of mutations that provide really vastly beneficial traits very like it's it's usually a disorder it's usually a defect usually cancer and if the if the mutation does have some benefit it's minimal so that's the problem with mutation that we, the mutations do happen most of them are don't do anything or they do damage so we don't really have many beneficial mutations and some people have calculated i don't know if it's in the slide but no it's not here but uh, some scientists have calculated how much time you would need to generate all of the millions of species that we have today. Think about how diverse they are. It's incredible. Right? Watch one of the, like, watch Planet Earth or one of these nature documentaries. Just the diversity of life on Earth is unbelievable. And to generate all of that diversity based on the rates of mutation, it just doesn't work. Like, if you do the math, and whoever's interested, I can send you the math later. It doesn't work you you the universe is not old enough like based on what we know the earth is, has been around for four and a half billion years it's not enough time even if there was life here from the very beginning four and a half billion years ago which there wasn't but even if there was it's not enough time just mathematically it's there's not enough time to generate all of the this variation all the diversity that we have today based on what we actually know of mutation rates That this is a huge problem for evolution. Related to that is that we see something really interesting. It's called saltationism. There is this in the past, there was kind of like a debate between gradualism and saltationism. The original thinking was that evolution was gradualism, that evolution takes place slowly over time. So you would kind of see like a tree of life where things kind of branch out neatly. And as time goes on, you have more and more and more species. That's what we would expect. But that's not what we find at all. What we find is not gradualism, but saltationism. We find jumps, these massive leaps of speciation that almost like you see suddenly, very suddenly, a huge amount of life in a short period of time, and then nothing. And then again, a huge burst of life, and then nothing. So the most famous example of that is the Cambrian explosion. Something like around 550 million years ago, you have this huge burst of life. All the major life forms on Earth emerge almost simultaneously at that period. Everything, fish and reptiles and mammals and all the stuff, dinosaurs, everything just emerged all at, seemingly all at once. It makes no sense. We would have expected very slow, gradual, steady, progression, speciation, more and more species over time, but we don't see that. We see mass extinctions and then flourishing of life. And then again, like nothing's happening for a while. Then again, very 
that's what saltation is. It means there's very sudden changes, sudden, very massive, pronounced changes that don't fit with that, what we would have thought. So Niles Eldridge, I'm quoting him because he's a very well-known biologist, paleontologist. So he said that the pattern in the fossil record that we were told to find for the past 120 years just doesn't exist. It's, it's not there. The fossil record is not there. It's not what it should have been based on evolution. Things just pop up up here and, and we can't explain it. It reminds me the other day, Mike is here. Mike and I were talking about uh, the cola drilling uh, sites in Russia. I, I don't know if anybody's heard of, of this, but in the 70s, the Soviet scientists started drilling in the north there by the Arctic Circle. They started drilling a hole into the ground to see how deep they can get. And they went 12 kilometers down. And they found all kinds of strange things. One of the things that they found is actual life forms, like fossils of living things, like way below in a place where they shouldn't exist. Like it just made no sense. Why is there, why are there life forms there? Fossilized life forms, very, very deep in the earth where there should theoretically be no life. Uh, so there's all kinds of issues that pop up that seem to contradict evolution. So the fossil record is actually not as strong of a piece of evidence as we think. Here's one headline that I saw. I remember just reading it when it came up, came up 2018. <clears throat> Sweeping gene survey reveals new facets of evolution. Uh, let's read this. I need this. And yeah. It is textbook biology, for example, that species with large far-flung populations like ants, rats, humans become more genetically diverse over time but it doesn't seem to actually be true. So just this, what I highlighted here, the study's most startling result is that nine out of 10 species on earth today, including humans came about based on these estimates only a hundred to 200,000 years ago. So again, the idea of saltationism of sudden proliferation of life, inexplicably sudden, inexplicable proliferation of life, nine out of 10 species on earth, 90%, of the mil, we have two to three million species of things on Earth emerged very, very recently. When you consider the time scale that we're talking about, several billion years, and most of that life emerged in the past two hundred thousand years. That doesn't bode well for classical thinking of evolution. You see the problem. Okay, so you have sudden, very sudden, rapid proliferation of life doesn't fit the gradual model. This is even more, this is something that I've been thinking about for a very, very long time. Before this, I was happy when this article came out, but this is an issue that I had going back to the, when I was learning this in university. And I'm happy that now science is actually talking about it. We always, we were, we were always taught in school about that famous picture of like, the apes becoming humans you know that famous nonsense picture of like an ape slowly getting up like a, the hunched ape and then he slowly the next one's a little more upright more upright more upright and then you have a human and we've all seen that before right and so we're we've always been taught that before homo sapiens there were all these other hominids and like a human-like different species of homo something else but not homo sapiens and how do we, how do we even know that? How, like you find a skull, you found, you find some bones in the ground. How do you s determine that that's a different species? There's a great book called, in, I think it's called In the Footsteps of Eve. And you read that book and I think it'll, it'll help clarify what we've actually found. Because people have this idea that we find these skeletons all over and we're so certain that there are all these other hominids. We used to be all these other hominids out there. But what we found is minimal. It's like you find a few bones and then scientists recreate them. They simulate what they would have looked like. Well, based on what? How do you know that? All you found was a pinky and a toe bone and like a little piece here, a little piece there. You have no clue what that is. So this was a great study <clears throat> published in Science, which is a preeminent journal. So this is not like something pseudoscientific or something like that. 
And the conclusions of these scientists is Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus. We all heard these terms before. Everybody remembers Homo erectus, Homo habilis, right? Those are actually not different species. They're all the same. Right? The differences one per once perceived to be the mark of separate species are just the result of normal variation in physical features, age, and gender. It's a really big deal, right? What we're saying here is that this image that we've seen before of all these, how we found so many different hominid species, they're not all these different species. It's all one species. And with Neanderthals, the most famous of the hominids, this is the funniest because we're always taught that Neanderthals were a different species. And at the same time, we're always taught that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals interbred with each other and that you can have you know that we have neanderthal dna you can do a genetic test like a little like i did like a 23 and me or whatever and they'll tell you what percentage of your dna is neanderthal dna so if you're telling me that homo sapiens and neanderthals interbred and we have neanderthal dna how could they be different species if we're defining species like we said at the beginning what's a species two individuals or two organisms that can breed and produce offspring that can breed, that's one species. Mm -hmm. So you're contradicting your own definition of what a species is. How can Neanderthals and Homo sapiens be a different species when they clearly interbred and we still carry Neanderthal DNA? You see the problem? They're one species. The evidence for all these different hominids is minimal and very weak. And finally, <clears throat> I think the greatest piece of evidence that kind of contradicts or not doesn't contradict evolution because really it's a separate topic because evolution only works when you have already life on Earth and you already have all that genetic machinery there. But how did that genetic machinery even come about? Where did it come from? like the complexity of this, of this stuff, if you remember, like just the complexity of DNA and all the enzymes and the ribosomes and this whole process, protein synthesis, it's even just a cell. How do you get a cell to exist? When you think of what a cell is, when you think of the cell membrane, I mean, the first thing is you need in a cell to, to have a life really, you need some kind of cell, right? The smallest unit of life is a cell. That's the foundation of cell theory but to make a cell you need a cell membrane to start with the membrane is so complex complex when i was in university there was a fourth year course that was called cell membrane it's a whole course on the cell membrane so for a whole semester imagine for a whole semester for four or five months all you're learning about is the cell membrane can you imagine how much there is to know about the cell membrane? Like how complex just the membrane is, just this little bubble. It is so incredibly complex. There's so much to know about just the membrane. And, and to suggest that that just popped into existence or somehow through natural processes, you know, in a primordial soup, we like to use that term primordial soup, somewhere in a lake, in a pond, in a hot spring, just the right amount of methane, and carbon dioxide and whatever and water just happened there was a lightning strike and there just happened to be the exact right amount of heat and energy and and they just happened to no there's no way to make that work there to this day there is no logical accepted really empirical explanation for the origins of life okay, that whole primordial soup thing most serious biologists will not accept it one of them is i mentioned here at the bottom carl woes i know that specifically because i don't know carl woes personally but um my my professor in university who i was closest with who i you know I, we were we had a we we, just, we spent a lot of time talking and i i was influenced by him uh, he was a student of carl woes so he was a, he worked in his lab carl woes is a very very famous microbiologist he should have won a Nobel Prize, probably one of the greatest snubs in Nobel Prize history. But if he would have lived a little longer, he probably would have won. But he passed away in 2012. Um, Carl Lowe's helped us figure out the whole genetic code. He reorganized life, uh, did a lot of work on this 
type of life called Archaea. Very, very famous. Some people consider him equal to or even at, greater than Carl, uh, Charles Darwin. So Woz was a big, big deal. He was one of the people that didn't like this whole primordial soup idea. He was actually believed in God. He was a theist. A the, the, not an atheist, a theist, a deist, if you want. I don't know if it's the same. Some people say it's not the same. But a theist of some sort. He, he tried to give other explanations of how life might have formed. But nobody knows. Nobody has any idea. Um, Stephen uh, Gould, another famous biologist, if you equate the probability of the birth of a bacterial cell to chance assembly of its atoms, eternity will not suffice to produce one. Same idea, right? Even an eternity of time. This thing will not just emerge on its own. It doesn't matter. It's not something so complex, something so incredible will not form by itself. Not even if you leave it for eternity. And that's just a bacterial cell, which is way, 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 way simpler than one of your eukaryotic cells. Francis Crick, remember Watson and Crick? Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA. So Francis Crick said, an honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us now could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle, almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. And I, want, I, I like to mention Francis Crick because Francis Crick thought that life came to Earth from another planet. Seriously. So it's a, it's a popular idea. It's a popular idea that life must have started somewhere else in the universe because we can't explain how it could have started here. So it must have started somewhere else and came here. Yeah. Simon Conway Morris, another famous biologist. <laughs> the number of potential blind alleys is so enormous that in principle, all the time since the beginning of the universe would be insufficient to find the one in a trillion trillion solutions that actually work. Life is simply too complex to be assembled on any believable time scale. So I, you get the idea that if you appreciate how complex even a single cell is, there's no way that it emerged by itself now without some something. Yeah. I don't want to say designer, but I think designer something. So that's that. So we saw the, ev the, the evidence for evolution, <clears throat> which is pretty strong, gives us reason to believe in to accept evolution as a thing it, it is it is a thing it's happening species are changing we can't we can't ignore that at the same time we're seeing a lot of holes in the overall theory and we can't explain the biggest question which is how did life actually emerge no way to explain that at all and even some of the experiments if you remember the yuri miller experiment that they use as proof of how life can form from non-life that experiment also was full of holes and still doesn't get, for those who might be thinking about what about that experiment that we learned about, still doesn't get you to life, right? It produced some basic molecules, organic molecules, but it doesn't come anywhere near making even something like a cell membrane. Yeah. So what do we do? How do we deal with all this? Okay, how do we reconcile the evidence for and against evolution? So this is a, I, I wrote a new approach, but it's actually not a new approach. It's an old new approach. So this is theistic evolution. Okay, so theistic, meaning somehow involving God. So can we reconcile evolution with the Torah? That's the question. Okay. So the, we, the Mishnah tells us this. Basara ma'amarot nivra ha'olam. Okay, which means that God created the universe with 10 utterances. We mentioned that before we talked about that, that God didn't sit there. You know, God is not, we can't anthropomorphize God into like a human. He wasn't like sitting with Lego blocks and making life, right? God is infinite, eternal. We can't even fathom God. So our sages say, how did God actually create everything? Through 10 utterances, basara mamrot, right? And that's what we see in the Torah, that God spoke 10 times. God said, let there be, and there was. God spoke and everything came into existence. And one of those 10 utterances, everything that came into existence came about through 10 utterances. One of those 10 utterances is, 
ויאמר אלוהים, תדשה הארץ דשא עשב מזריע זרע, right? So God told the earth, תדשה הארץ, let the earth bring forth vegetation and trees and so on, let me know, according to its kind, whatever it needs, whatever the type it needs. And then another one of the sayings of those utterances, ויאמר אלוהים, תוצא הארץ נפש חיה למינה. So God told the earth, he said, תוצא הארץ, let the earth bring forth life according to its kind. So the Torah is not saying that God sat there and created every organism the way it is and that's it. What the Torah is actually saying is that God told the earth to bring forth life as necessary. So God programmed into the earth the ability to bring forth all these species, lemina, according to its type, whatever species it needs. So we need God to get the process started. We need God for the origin of life. And once it's there, God says, go for it. He sets the rules in place of evolution, natural selection, and oversees the process. That's the, the, basically theistic evolution. That evolution does happen, but there's no way that it's happening without some godly force overseeing it and moving it from one stage to the next. That will explain saltationism. It will explain why we see very sudden bursts of life at specific periods of time in the past. And why we have sudden mass extinctions and then boom, new proliferation of life and then not much happening. And then again, okay, so there's some divine element here, somebody controlling that process. So that is theistic evolution. So yes, evolution, because we see evidence for it, but with some divine element, some supernatural element that is shaping this process. And I think that actually fills the hole, the gaps in evolutionary theory. So it helps both Torah and science. It helps us understand both better. The Ramban actually says something also that supports this idea. What does that mean? God decreed that within the earth itself will be Koach, the power to bring forth all these things. Koach atzomech v'molid, some kind of force, power in the earth that sprouts new life and gives birth to new life. And so that's what the Ramban is saying. God programmed the earth to bring forth life. Rabbi Arya Kaplan, we talked about him last time. Here he is again. One of the greatest thinkers of, of recent times, maybe of all time. So in his handbook of Jewish thought, in the original version, which has since been censored, which is an issue, a different issue to discuss a different day. But he says there, on the fifth and sixth days, respectively, the Torah states, God said the water shall teem with swarms of living creatures. And God said the earth shall bring forth particular species of living creatures. This indicates that God did not actually create life at this time, but merely imparted in matter the unique properties that would make the evolution of lower and eventually higher forms of animal life inevitable. Okay, so Rabbi Kaplan understood it the same way. That, that's the, really, in my opinion, that's the pshat. That's the simplest reading of the Torah, that God told the earth to bring forth life as necessary, when necessary. That's what the Ramban said, that God gave the earth, koach atzomech v'molid, the power to bring forth, to sprout forth life, to give birth to new life. And that's how Rabbi Kaplan understood it. Even though that particular sentence has been censored because evolution has become such a sensitive topic in the religious world. The Zohar, I think, we always end up getting to the Zohar. Um, the Zohar, I think, says it most beautifully. It says, So this, the Zohar is like quoting an even earlier mystical text. Parish Yatiri was explained that, first of all, something amazing, as an aside, kol yeshuva, that the entire earth, mit galgala be'igula kakadu, that the entire earth is rotating like a ball. That's really amazing for something that was first published in around 1290, considering, right, this is over 700 years ago, and it's telling you that the earth is a sphere that rotates like a ball. Okay, this, the rotation of the earth was not confirmed until the eight, late 1800s. 
Okay. So this is in the 1200s. The Zohar is telling you in the 1200s something that science had no clue about and wouldn't know for a long, long, long time. But it's saying that the world is spinning, mit galgala beigulaka kadul, spinning like a ball. And it says that there are people, ilain letata ilain leela. There are people at the bottom and people at the top. Right. So if you were wondering how people could live, the Zohar is saying. If it's a ball, why don't people fall off, right? There's people at the bottom of the ball, you know what I'm saying? Like people at the top, people at the bottom. Why don't people fly off into space? So he's saying, well, there's some kind of force that's holding them down onto the ball, gravitational force. Vecholinun, so all these Brian created things, Mishnain, Vechazveu, they look different in their appearance. They are different species. Why? Mishinuya de Avira, because of the difference in the atmosphere, the environment, kfum kolatar v'atar, according to each land, every different region, every land. Isn't that just saying, talking about evolution, in other words? Right? You have different organisms in different parts of the world, in different land, different lands, and they are, they're, they have variations because, mishinuya de avila, because of the difference of the environment that they're in. So that's what evolution is really saying, right? The idea of adaptation, being more fit to survive in your particular, in that particular environment. Adapting to your environment. Uh, before I conclude, I want to address Javid's question about how do we deal with chapter two of Genesis talking about the creation of Adam. And I think the classic answer to that is that the Torah actually speaks about the creation of man twice in cha chapter one and chapter two. So in chapter one, the creation of man is on the sixth day with all the animals. And in chapter two, then God creates a unique man, Ha-Adam. Before it said Adam, just generic Adam, the creation of mankind. And then in chapter two, it said that God created specifically Ha-Adam, a unique man into which he blew Nishmat Chaim. He gave him a Nishama. So I think what the Torah is saying, this was a classic question in throughout history. People asked thinkers, rabbis, why does the Torah speak of seemingly speak of creation twice? It talks about the creation of man in Genesis 1, and then again in Genesis 2. Why? Why would you say it twice? So I think that, it's just an opinion, just a suggestion, that in chapter 1, God created Adam without a hay, just generic Adam, mankind, together with the animals on the sixth day, implying the creation of just homo sapiens. And then in chapter two, that was the creation of a unique person, Ha-Adam, the man. It says there specifically Ha-Adam. He created the man into which he blew a neshama, and that was the birth of civilization. And so chapter two is actually telling us about the specific unique creation of a unique homo sapien that was now with the neshama, with the divine neshama. So from like the historical, the, arche the archeological, paleontological record, we see that homo sapiens have been around, like we mentioned earlier, maybe 200,000 years or so. So there were all these homo sapiens, all these, let's say cavemen, whatever you want to call them, uncivilized men before Adam. So I think what chapter one is talking about is Adam without a hay, just generic mankind of Homo sapiens. Chapter one is the creation of Homo sapiens that existed for about 200,000 years, right? We find their bones, their caves. That was chapter one. And then in chapter two was Ha'adam, the unique man with the divine soul, which was the birth of civilization. Okay. Make sense? That would be the distinction between chapter one and two and how we can reconcile creating a unique man from the dust of the earth and blowing a soul, which was chapter two, and also the previous to that creation of generally Homo sapien that's more of like an animal without a neshama, because in chapter one, a neshama is not mentioned, and it was on the sixth day with all the animals. In chapter two, you have a neshama already. That's about that. That's the, the distinction between the first Adam and Ha'adam, the, the, the specific man in chapter two. So that's Theistic evolution is this idea that evolution is a thing, but it's driven by God. So Francis Collins is one of the today modern proponents of 
uh, theistic evolution. So evolution occurred as biologists describe it, but under the direction of God. So Francis Collins is famous because he led the Human Genome Project. And the Human Genome Project, which ran from roughly 1989 to 2003, approximately, 2000, 2003, to, to decode, to uncover the whole human genome. He ran that project. And originally he was an atheist, agnostic. Eventually he became a very religious, very devout person. So he holds by theistic evolution. He's one of the most famous biologists and geneticists in the world. And I think even Charles Darwin in his, the groundbreaking book on the origin of species, I think he, he held the same, we don't know exactly what Darwin's views were about more religious, spiritual things, not exactly. But I think uh, certainly he wrote about it in his book. Maybe he wrote it only to be, try to be less controversial, but whatever the case, I think it's accurate because this is his words, which are very nice and poetic. There's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms. And from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have evolved, right? So even Darwin in the origin of, on, on the origin of species talks about the idea of life having been originally breathed by the creator. And then we have evolution. And I want to mention this gentleman because today, one of the greatest evolutionists in the world who's been called by some the next darwin that's him jeremy england and you probably noticed he has a keeper on his head because he's an orthodox jew so the next darwin is an orthodox jew apparently could be so i, I just bring him up this is an interesting article in aussie that you can read i can post the link later uh, about you know, his views of being an Orthodox Jew and at the same time being one of the top evolutionists in the world. So I, the idea is that there is no contradiction between them. There, there doesn't have to be a contradiction. You can be an Orthodox Jew and an evolutionist at the same time. And you put God in the picture and everything works out. So <clears throat> uh, just to finish off for today, uh, I think with the cell, uh, we see God's fingerprints in creation, really, because the cell is just so incredible and so complex. And I mentioned before that I only became more spiritual, more religious while I was studying biochemistry because it was just too amazing, Re really seeing God's fingerprints in creation, seeing the beauty of, of life at the, on the smallest level. And we see that everywhere else. So we talked about this before. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into this because we did it in a previous class about God's fingerprints in creation, about how the universe is so fine-tuned. That was part three of our Fundamentals of Kabbalah series. So you can go back to that and how our universe is so perfectly precise, mathematical, so fine-tuned. So Paul Davies, scientists are slowly waking up to an inconvenient truth. The universe looks suspiciously like a fix. Right? It's not uh, as random as we, we thought. It looks like everything is already pre-programmed. Uh, Fred Hoyle, who coined the term Big Bang, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. You'll find a lot of, a lot of great scientists say similar things like that. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I'll just give one example of God's fingerprints in creation kind of relevant now, which is when something like a lunar a solar eclipse happens, the sun, the, the moon blocks out the sun and it does it quite perfectly, right? We've all seen, maybe not live, but we've all seen uh, <clears throat> what a solar eclipse looks like. How does that work? I was teaching this the other day to my grade nine class, science class. We have a little unit on astronomy. And of course, one of the students asked, and it always comes up, how is it possible that the moon can block out the sun if the moon is so much smaller? The moon is tiny compared to the sun. So how is it able to block out the sun? And the answer is that the moon is by diameter 400 times smaller than the sun. But at the same time, the sun is 400 times further away from us than the moon. That's a really beautiful, dare I say, coincidental relationship. 
probably not a coincidence but it's 400 times smaller in diameter and also happens to be 400 times closer, which makes the sun and moon rough pretty much the same size in the sky when we look at them. That is really an amazing, I don't wanna say coincidence, uh, but to an atheist, maybe that's just a coincidence, but this is just one example of the, the preciseness of this universe, right? the beauty of the universe, whether it's the smallest things like a little cell which is like really a universe in itself or in the solar system and the galaxies at large. I'm just gonna end with this. I'm gonna give the final word to Francis Collins again uh, because I think he, he captures the, the, the problem that we have in society today. So he says, most people really are seeking, you know, harmony between the worldviews, between science and faith. And it seems rather sad that we hear so little about this possibility. And I think that really captures the issue, the problems. Like people, most people actually want to reconcile science and faith. They want to have a little bit of both, uh, to make sense of both. But instead we hear the opposite. We often hear how science and religion contradict each other. We don't hear enough about how they harmonize each other and support each other. And I think you get to the best understanding of both, both Torah and science. You know, they, they help each other. You know, when you understand science better, like we saw last time, like some of our sages said, like the Vilna Gaon and the Maharal said, that when you understand, the better you understand science, it'll help you better understand the Torah. And, and vice versa. I think the better you understand Torah, the better you'll be able to understand science. So it reminds me, I'm just going to finish with this. Uh, uh, one of my professors would say he, he was also a student of Joshua Lederberg, who was one of the great bacteriologists, he, like a huge figure in microbiology. Uh, and he, he, he talked about how actually his religion, you know, his being Jewish, influenced his science. He was the son of a, a conservative rabbi or chazan or whatever. And he talked about how really strongly faith actually helped him in science, you know, applying. And I think even like how gematria and things like that of, of actual Jewish uh, principles of thought actually helped him in his scientific quest to become perhaps, you know, one of the greatest microbiologists in the world. So the, the two help each other, okay? Science and Torah and religion, they really support each other. They don't contradict. Uh, I think they, they only enhance each other and that's how we should always study them both. When we're studying science or Torah, whatever it is, that having the other in mind uh, will help us better understand Torah, the science, and also just ourselves, life around us and everything else.